There has been a delay in starting the event for which, of course, we have to apologize, but I'm afraid it arises from the vagaries of air transport, which we've heard a lot about this year. I don't know what the exact issue is today, but um, our distinguished um, uh, guest speaker, keynote speaker, Laura Sands, unfortunately has been delayed. However, she is in the car on the way from the airport. So we expect her to arrive uh, soon. Um, depending on what the traffic is like between here and the airport, she is in that car. So she will be here in, we hope, a matter, a short uh, uh, matter of minutes. Um, this is an amazing building and we are so grateful to the ESB for having us um, here today, as it were. And to, um, to mark that and to say a few words at the outset, I'm going to invite uh, Geraldine Heavey, who's Executive Director of Enterprise Services with the ESB, just to address you briefly, Geraldine. So good afternoon, everybody. And on behalf of ESB, I'm delighted to welcome you all here for the first hybrid lecture in this year's Rethink Energy Series in association with the IIEA. And for those of you in person here today, you are very welcome to Fitzwilliam 27, ESB's head office. This Rethink Energy Series brings experts and thought leaders from around the world to share their insights and analysis with us on the future of energy. And today I am delighted shortly uh, to welcome um, to Fitzwilliam 27, our distinguished speaker, Laura Sands, CBE, who brings an absolute wealth of experience and a really interesting perspective to this subject. I know Laura's speech today will touch on critical parts of the energy transition, in particular, the significant role of digitalization and the importance of placing the customer at the center as we move forward. And from my own brief in ESB, I can see firsthand the transformational shifts and opportunities that come from digitalization, and we are only at the start of that journey. And by leveraging data and digital technologies, we have an opportunity to completely transform the electricity sector and accelerate the transition to net zero energy. In fact, ESB's Driven to Make a Difference strategy calls out digital and data as one of just the four foundational capabilities in the delivery of our net zero by 2040 strategy. And right across our business, we are leveraging digital and data solutions to enhance system efficiency and resilience, improve customer experiences and enable people to work smarter. Our use of AI in ensuring the quality of the rollout of the National Smart Metering Programme is a great example of this. With the development of new digitally enabled technologies, including smart meters, electric vehicles, and network sensors, we recognize there is a massive opportunity to unlock flexibility and enable customers to engage more actively in the connected energy system of the future. In Ireland, customers with smart meters already have the technology to switch to smart tariffs and take greater control over their energy use. And the most active customers are combining a range of technologies, such as solar panels, EVs, and smart meters to minimize their e um, energy costs and reduce emissions. But we really have only begun to scratch the surface in terms of what is possible. Last winter, ESB Networks introduced their Beat the Peak pilot encouraging customers to amend their consumption to help reduce electricity demand at peak times. Thousands of customers signed up to receive energy saving tips and alerts, and the insights from this pilot will be used going forward to refine and develop our approach to active demand side management. And while the energy crisis has increased people's awareness of their energy consumption, and we see more and more customers embracing new technologies and actively managing their energy use, not all customers will have the ability nor the desire to adopt these new technologies unless it's extremely simple or compelling for them to do so. Our challenge here in ESB and indeed for the wider energy sector is to help customers access the benefits of these new technologies by developing products and services that are intuitive and add real value to people's lives. For example, Electric Ireland's Home Electric Plus product provides advanced insights to customers on their actual home usage device, device usage. So to sum up, I'd say this is a very exciting time for our sector. It is critical that we leverage the ever-growing power of digital and data to partner with our customers in the transition to zero carbon energy. I really am looking forward to hearing from Laura this afternoon. And now I'll hand you back to the chair of today's event. So back to you, Alex. Thank you, everyone.
So you're all thinking, what's he going to do now? <laughs> um, uh, Geraldine has made the point about the enormous, you know, IT input uh, and um, uh, that there is in this in entire agenda. And ESB really has been a trailblazer in relation to that, as she has touched on. Um, and what I was going to ask just for a few minutes in the short, we hope, few minutes that will be before um, our guest speaker uh, arrives, is to ask Mary O'Connor, who is the Chief Information Officer in the ESB, just to maybe elaborate on some of those points, perhaps not for too long. We'll just operate on the basis that we, when we see our guest arriving that we will, we will, I worked in radio years ago, so I'm not going to give you any of these signals or anything like that, but we'll work it out between us because our guest speaker will arrive and obviously we're going to make time, but we're delighted and thank you for stepping into the breach, but also it's an important uh, matter in any event. So we're delighted just to hear the elaboration on some of the points that Geraldine has touched on. Mary O'Connor, thank you very much. Um, nothing like working at ESB. Every day is a, a surprise. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, digitalization at, at ESB. This is the placemat of our um, Brighter Future strategy. And uh, it's, it's a really exciting strategy with decarbonization right at the heart of it. And you can see our purpose up there um, and our three strategic objectives of decarbonized electricity, resilient infrastructure and empowered customers. But at the next level down, you can see our four enabling capabilities, our foundational capabilities of people, financials, ESG, and for the first time ever featuring in our corporate strategy, digital and data, and really leveraging it to transform ESB to a data-driven utility with our values underpinning everything um, in how we do that. And we have a vision, we set our vision for, for digitalization at ESB, that through data and technology, we will deliver real value to our customers and lead decarbonization by radically adapting our businesses and transforming our employees' experience. And we have a framework that, you know, is, is overarching and kind of pulls it all together. And right at the center of that is the customer and the customer's experience. And how do we drive out the best possible customer experience for our customers? We do it by driving out the best possible employee experience for, for all our people. That is enabled in turn by um, modernizing our business, uh, our business models, how we operate, how we manage our assets, uh, and how we work on a day-to-day -day basis. And then that in turn is enabled through data and technology. And behind all of those, there's a significant amount of, of detail um, in terms of you know, what we're focusing on. I'm going between the two the slides and my own laptop here. So forgive me if I'm a little bit disjointed. Um, bear with me. Uh, so an awful lot to focus on in, under all of those. And in the meantime, there's a fundamental shift happening in industry, in, in how, how organizations are run and how they operate. And that shift is going from siloed businesses and business units to value-driven hybrid teams working collaboratively, from being process-led to being experience-led with the customer at the heart, from fixed scope and timeline to iterative products evolving based on value, and from tracking project milestones to focusing on tracking value and delivering a step change in business outcomes. And all of that really is going from waterfall to agile. So we're very much on this journey at ESB, but can you imagine for a utility founded in 1927 and what could be seen as a traditional uh, electricity utility, driving out digitalization, different ways of working, um, focusing on different things. It's a massive challenge. And that is why we have defined an operating model to do this that takes us from our very high level vision and unconstrained thinking, very much focusing on people experience, customer experience and being data driven. Then identifying the opportunities to deliver that vision and prioritizing all based on value, but with experience at the heart of it and marrying those experiences that are necessary for our customer and our employees with the underlying processes. 
putting top-down funding in place and targeting value. And then from there, we've identified a roadmap of opportunities across large-scale delivery pillars. And we're doing this with, with all our businesses across ESB, with, um, with, with uh, ESB networks, with generation and trading, with customer solutions, and indeed our own enterprise services, and also our engineering and major projects business, going from very high level, unconstrained thinking, visionary thinking of what the future needs to look like to enable decarbonization, right through to the hard work of delivery of that, of that vision. And that operating model consists of five steps um, from that very high level strategic alignment next to the strategic design of what that future looks like, shaping and prioritization in terms of what are the opportunities, what are the products and solutions to be delivered, planning those solutions in detail, taking into account things like cyber requirements and stuff like that. And then it's just one little row there, but the hard, hard work of delivering. In all of that, we've set out a number of transform transformation deliverables that are key. This thinking and coming together that's required at a very early stage in order to deliver the right products at the end of the day. So I suppose when you think about digitalization and IT in a traditional sense, you wouldn't think of a lot of these things like culture transformation, um, principles, uh, value targets, reference architecture, the vision, the North Star, these things wouldn't uh, traditionally have come into, let's say, IT, but they're very much required for digitalization because with digitalization, you're changing how an organization operates, uh, even how, how an, an, an organization thinks, what the mindsets are, um, how people collaborate, how they work together. Um, so it, it's, it's very much a, nearly a, an all of organization approach. Um, in doing all that, we've had some achievements along the way. Um, data and becoming a data-driven organization has, we've made great strides here. It's improving decision-making, understanding and managing our business performance and analyzing and solving business problems using data. And here there's a collection of um, dashboards and um, you know, um, bringing together information at all levels. Um, of the organization with that ability to drill down. Um, that's becoming, let's say, business as usual now in all parts of, of ESB. Here are a few examples of, of some of the digital products um, and a very much increase in the, these types of products. Power check, you may all have engaged with that at times of storm, where it helps us, helps the customer um, get the latest information on outages impacting them. Um, Jer mentioned smart metering. Um, in ESB networks, we have new connections online now with over 90%, and I'm sure somebody who knows more about it will correct me if I have the figure wrong, but I think over 90% of new connections with ESB networks are now all digital um, online. So various examples there, um, things like guided buying in our enterprise services and community engagement app and generation and trading. So spanning all our businesses um, and spanning customer experience, and employee experience, as well as how we operate and manage assets. Indeed, AI is um, playing more and more of a feature here. I think we've over 20 AI use cases um, rolled out now, and our current and immediate crusade is learning more and more about Gen AI and identifying the use cases across ESP, where we, we really think and see the Gen AI has significant uh, potential to play. Um, we are the first and maybe the only Irish organization to um, take part in the Microsoft uh, early um, adopter program for Microsoft Copilot. And we're very excited at the moment planning that with our businesses. On the left of this slide is, is a depiction of the AI use case that Jerome mentioned, whereby um, we used Microsoft Cognitive Services um, to judge the quality of the meter installations in the network smart metering program, where the technician takes a photograph of the meter installation, uploads it, and it's compared with um, a whole um, bank of good quality um, meter installations and judges the quality of the meter installation on, on that basis. But other AI use cases as well, um, in sentiment analysis and uh, contact analysis and uh, various other, other examples. We've even um, 
had received, or at least our teams have received external recognition. And we have, um, we've been lucky enough to um, receive a number of awards, uh, some global awards and some national awards um, for the work that our teams have done um, across ESB. And that really is an accolade and it's a, it's a nice accolade to have for our people who you know, put the hard work in day in, day out. It's also lovely to see that our, our wonderful people are winning awards as well, like our analytics team and future leader of the year and data leader of the year in that team as well. So um, not uh, important in one way, but very important in another way. In all of that then, um, we recognize that um, this won't be possible unless we uplift the capability of all our people across all our teams. Sometimes people can think that this is a matter for the IT and digital teams only, but technology and data and digital is all pervasive now. So it's a, it's, it's a very relevant challenge for all teams and all parts of the business. And we see this as two sides of, of the same coin, accelerating digital capability and also the culture, the mindset, the ways of working. Um, so we are executing a capability program across the entirety of ESB, of ESB to uplift that digital capability, but not only the capability, uh, the confidence, the confidence to use the tools in a very effective way across the technical teams, as well as the, the back office teams. And in so doing, changing our culture uh, to a, a very highly collaborative way of working, bringing different expertise together, for example, converging IT with operational technology and so on. And I think that might be a nice segue to the main event. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, um, Mary. That was that was terrific. And thanks for uh, stepping in um, uh, to uh, elaborate on those points for us. We're delighted. I'm going to do the introduction even as our guest speaker joins us, and I'm, I don't even have an opportunity. I'll, I'll, I'll dispense with the opportunity that I would otherwise have to say hello and shake hands, so I'll do that afterwards. But we're delighted to be joined today by um, former Conservative MP and Chair of the UK Government's Energy Digitalisation Task Force, Laura Sands, CBE. Um, Laura's very professional experience includes time spent in journalism, public relations and advocacy, but obviously um, very well known uh, as for her service as a member of parliament in the South Thanet uh, constituency between 2010 and 2015. You know, there's loads of stuff written down here about uh, Laura that I could tell you, but I'm going to just cut that if that's all right. We can come back to it afterwards. Um, she um, has a huge amount to offer on the agenda that we're interested in. I'm going to dispense with any further introduction. I know she won't mind that. And you can check her out on LinkedIn anyway and all over the place. So delighted to welcome straight to the podium from the airport. Not her fault that she was delayed. You're so welcome, uh, Laura Sands. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And many apologies for a plane two hours sitting at uh, Gatwick. And um, but just wonderful to be here in Dublin. So thank you all very much. And thank you to Mary, who was the star of the show. So I'm merely here as the follow up. <laughs> and it's lovely to see John. We work together on the Northern Irish Advisory Group for, the, for their energy strategy. Thank you all very much. And so I think I have been asked to do a little tour of what possibly, what I think probably the energy sector is going to look like in the future. And um, <clears throat> as a recovering politician, I, am, <laughs> I have just about re-entered the human race. Um, when I left politics, I decided instead of being one of these sort of broad political people, I would become a plumber. Because ultimately, it's the plumbing of the energy system and how we look at it that really needs to change. Um, not that I'm very good when the system goes wrong or the boiler, but when it comes to energy, I have a few um, contestable ideas, and I hope that you will contest them. So um, I've done quite a lot of work with Imperial College, with lots of other collaborators, and ESB was one of the funders of one of my uh, reports on regulation. But this was really, this report that we did, and it would be, this is a bit of a synthesis, 
was about um, the recosting, how we've got to look at this system quite differently and how the system changes are going to absolutely demand us to have different business models. And so ESB, this is an interesting um, proposition possibly from your perspective, but also digitalization and modernization. Now you can start throwing tomatoes at this particular moment, but you know something, the energy sector, pretty old fashioned, not quite there, you know, at the forefront of how the system works. But here we are, this is a politician sitting here, Dr. Doolittle, looking at the past and looking at the future. We've got in the past, big is beautiful. Um, there's this great thing by Ari Sargent, designed and built by engineers, bastardized by economists and marketeers. The power industry continues to deliver one of the most successful consumer confusion programs of all time. I mean, does one need to say anymore? And he is an energy supplier in New Zealand. So there you go, he does know. Our big is beautiful. We've got blind man's bluff. Um, we have, you know, an energy system operator in the UK. They think they know what the system looks like. And then suddenly the lights went out in 2019. And suddenly we find out they didn't know what the assets were on the system. So big is beautiful. We're moving to a very new world and it's a really difficult psychological change. Um, I have to have something from Monty Python on it. Blessed are the cheesemakers, because actually what we're talking about now is distributed system design, much, much more, um, many more capital assets rather than commodities. Transportation, you're in the networks business, other people are in transmission. Um, the networks cost is going to start to become a very, very different thing. So what does this really mean? Is we have got a new cost, a new value, and a new price for energy going forward. So we currently live in a world of a commodity, wonderful electron, but actually the commodity is going to go down in value. The capital costs that again have to sit everywhere within the system, in your driveway, on your roof, in the Irish Sea, on your transmission, the capital is what is going to be the core cost of the system and not a zero marginal cost of, of an electron, but a much, much lower one. And just think about this, 1990, a terabyte of data was a million dollars. Today, it's five cents. Now, I'm not saying an electron is going to go there, but we have got this very, very different system, very capital intensive. Then if we look at the consumer side, the consumer is going to have to access these assets. And so what are we going to have to do? They're never going to be able to do that off the back of a commodity. We're going to have to look at financial service products. We're going to have to look at different business propositions. There is a great thing that's going on in Spain at the moment, which is an eve, um, in villages, um, the network company is actually saying to the to everybody, they've all got solar, right? But to everybody, electricity is going to cost you absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. What you will have to do is buy a subscription to our storage capacity. So we become a very, very similar to cloud storage. And that's also where we're going to get different business models that are going to be weirdly, although I know centralized and big as beautiful people don't believe this, but actually the more distributed system we have potentially, and I think in reality, is more resilient, weirdly, if we set it up properly. But where is the value? And the value doesn't sit in those silos. The value sits in the optimization, which is the middle. And that is what, in many ways, the sector has not been always able to pick up. It hasn't been the most digitally savvy. It hasn't been the most um, aggressive when it comes to new technologies. But demand and supply will become equal, e equal value, not necessarily scale, but value within the system. So how can we pick that up? Now, I used to show this to Ofgem, our regulator, and Ofgem was in the middle, looking very confused, and they all got a little bit upset about this. But this is the new, in many ways, paradigm of if you're running an energy system, whether you're a regulator, whether you're a large company, is how are you going to manage all these different variants? 
and it's a very new set of requirements for the energy sector um, and we've got a lot of different dynamics all being shown here but in the UK we have 400 people who run the energy sector and weird they all know each other's golf handicaps it's fantastic and they are moving to 100 million actions and assets on the system so if you think every EV car can do three things export import and store if you think that the number of EVs on the system by 2035 our energy system operator says will be the equivalent of three nuclear power stations in terms of capacity right we have got a very different system and either we can ignore the 100 million and have to build absolutely extortionate amount of infrastructure or we have to bring it into the system so what have we got we've got a new system where whether I, I find it fascinating I know everybody in energy needs to understand the weather but you know what's fascinating is it doesn't take price signals it doesn't follow legislation it's got no we have no agency over weather we have a lot more agency over demand if we do it sens sensitively capital is king blending assets so I've come back to my cheese makers there are a lot of people in the energy sector who are commodity makers and I would call them milk farmers and I'm sure it's the same in Ireland but it's certainly the same in the UK milk farmers get screwed they get absolutely pushed right to the edge if you become a cheese maker you start to add value and how do we create blended products and assets balancing costs are absolutely rocketing rocketing and to be frank between balancing costs constraints etc and curtailment costs in the UK if the UK consumer really knew that ooh, I think um, we would have a lot more problems but our ESO says by six by 2035 60 percent will be done by demand that is a massive increase distributed asset values as I said EV cars and value of demand will be the new creator you could say that there is a new competitive pressure between those who deliver optimized demand and those who are looking at optimized supply and where that tension lies so the risks and opportunities we've got the big stuff well you all know about the big stuff we've got the clever stuff which I think um the energy sector is embarking on and starting and I'm sure Mary told you how brilliantly ESB is doing in this space etc um the new things is really the small so how do we create distributed asset models um the difficult which is my old life which I refuse to now talk about so that's something that your public affairs people and all of that will have to deal with but planning being absolutely the most delightful challenge I think for everybody but then there is the different and the different is customers different forms of, of fuel biodiversity and communications and I don't know whether Mary talked about this but if we are to have a digitalized system communications systems are going to have to be co-planned they're going to have to be as resilient as the energy system and I'll come on to a little example of that where things could have gone a bit pear-shaped um, and these are the three drivers of change new market player that is demand suddenly this customer who's been pretty I don't know whether it's the same in um in Ireland but in the UK we have divided 60 million people into six archetypes right Amazon divides the UK into 150,000 different archetypes so do we really think that six is is going to be adequate do we really understand our customer and do we really understand what our customer is prepared to do and how we should serve that the second is about digitalization fundamentally but it's about different business models blending um, resource optimization and the third which is probably one of the most important and I'll only skip on this at the end but I do you know you've got fabulous talents in Ireland 
but just start to think beyond the energy sector for that talent, because that is what we're going to need. We're need, needing logistics people, all sorts of different talents that need to come in to deliver a very different system. So I'm going to just start, start with demand. So I believe, and I'd love to hear other views, but anyway, I would believe that going forward, demand is equal to supply. Even the physics tells us that. Markets should be designed around it, but currently, actually, the de <clears throat> demand is seen as sort of a little bit the victim. The energy sector is a bit like a hose pipe, and it just sort of comes and sprays you with energy, and there isn't really that that thing. The, these are the costs. The ten percent under ten percent in the UK went to demand um, side assets um, in, in out of the so-called the, the UK government funding. We did some metrics, and I won't go into this in too much detail, but if you want to look at these metrics, this is apparently, I have been told, the first time ever has ever been done. And that is, we have compared demand and supply assets according to whole system costs, not according to the levelized cost of electricity, but as these other costs, such as networks, balancing costs, et cetera, come up. If you look at the whole system costs, then, and you start to compare demand and supply, what do you get? Every time you put a demand asset on the system, you lower whole system costs. It's really, really interesting. And that is <clears throat> something that I'm working with World Economic Forum with, the Bayes modeling team, um, our department's modeling team did this with me in Frontier Economics. And we're trying to get the treasury to start to understand that these demand assets actually lower whole system costs. But designed around customers, now it's quite interesting because again, and again, you can all shoot me, but I do think that we're quite far behind on ter in terms of understanding customers, really designing our products and propositions. I do a lot of work in the food sector and food is really, really interesting. When I was little, we had something called the milk marketing board, the beef marketing board, the uh -uh marketing board, right? And they set prices. And you go to your little shop around the corner and you would be a price taker and a choice taker. And actually very grotty stuff was there. Now you can say supermarkets are good or bad and there are lots of issues around that, but they sort of broke that up. But they then captured me totally. But now, actually, the patterns in food are starting to become dispersed. So I go for my base load to, let's say, Sainsbury's. And then I will have a bit of self-supply, right? Because I grow some carrots. You don't want to eat them, but I grow them. Um, and then I have some special supply, which is, you know, maybe a veg box or something delivered to me specifically, and I can go to the farmer's market. This is all designed around choice. There is one interesting thing about storage here as well, is the food sector, before we had refrigeration, food, uh, we lost about 60% of food. And what is refrigeration in energy? It's storage, but just Bear with me on my crazy analogy. Long duration storage, what's that? Frozen food. Grid scale batteries, refrigerated warehousing. EV cars, flash freezing. The most important component of the food system in terms of refrigeration is a fridge in your home. Because if you didn't have a fridge in your home, supermarkets would have to be four times the size they are today. So if you think in other sectors, what has happened, how we, how systems have been optimized, you only have two wheat crops a year, you eat bread every day. So actually the food system is more intermittent than the energy system. But these storage vectors have absolutely reduced and optimized system design. So I think it's a really interesting analogy. The second is um, from mainframe to PC. I mean, I remember, oh, have you not got a big IBM churning out in the back, right? Um, and everything was designed around these big, in many ways, again, a bit like hose pipe type analogy. You start to get the PC, which of course everyone said was going to be, would never work, never, nobody was ever going to take it up. 
and you've now got a system that's quite differently designed. It's not to say that you don't have large centralized supply of data, but what you have is it all, is all designed around my utilization. It is not designed, I am not having to design myself around the mainframe. So these demand models have all been, we've, other people have gone through the model. And then we have this other challenge coming up, which is this, the world of the customer is going to want more than energy. They are going to want assets too. And we were proposing, um, <clears throat> and I think some of it might happen in the capacity market. And apologies if I'm becoming very geeky here, so do. Um, but the capacity market and other markets, um, how are we going to unlock these assets for hard pressed customers? And the just transition is a really, really important component of this. And we're not going to be able to do it if we're expecting people to write out checks. So service agreements, financial service products, um, capacity market payments, et cetera, are all going to have to be really important. And I don't know whether it's the same um, here in Ireland, but it's really, really, really difficult to get um, policymakers to really understand that this has to be a consumer-led um, system. And so there's a recent consultation, sorry, there's a recent con consultation that's coming out on retail reform. And the word customer satisfaction or joy or pleasure or um, control or anything about customers is, is virtually invisible. It's all about structures and what the, the industry is going to do rather than customer centric. And so just to illustrate this, I have, I have a dream and the dream is that um, <clears throat> we open up the supply world to lots of different types of propositions. So it comes back to my specialist supply. So I would like Let's say the car leasing company is Nissan Car Leasing um, with 10,000 cars in Dublin. Okay, so they've got 10,000 cars. They are selling me, or they're leasing me a car with 300 miles embedded in it every week, right? So I don't really know I'm buying, I certainly don't know I'm buying electricity, that's for sure. I don't know really that I'm buying energy because fundamentally it's just come with the package so i get my 300 miles if of course i want to top up that's a different matter and more expensive right but anyway that is what and mr N nissan has got his 10,000 cars so what is he doing he's adding capacity to the system so there is a micro capacity market payment he also then sells not the 10,000 but 4,000, because to be frank, 8,000 are going to be static all the time, as we know. So you've got this sitting asset. So they will sell it to, I mean, they'll sell the flexibility to ESB networks in Dublin, right? And there will be that, that relationship. But also Nissan, rather than me, because I don't know how to access the best time, the best tariff, etc., will be absolutely determined and and focused on getting the cheapest commodity price possible because the incentive for them is to do that because in some ways we've now got an incentive with suppliers who their incentive is to supply you more energy but this model actually means that Nissan is really incentivized to get you the very very cheapest in the best way possible so the incentives are aligned I get a little bit of a cheaper car and I also get much, much cheaper miles. And I have no aggro. I don't have to be engaged. I hate that. When customers have to be engaged, sometimes it means that they that the energy world want them to become heating engineers. And I don't think that's, despite me saying that I like being a plumber, I'm just not sure that we're wanting to turn people into energy geeks. The second theme was about digitalization. And I'll be really, really quick on this, but. From the 400 to the 100 million of actions and assets, if anybody thinks they're going to be able to do this with the system design that we've got today, um, they're going to have a, a big shock, right? This is multiple changing consumer preferences. 
lots of interactions between different asset classes with different characteristics, different personalities. You've then got issues around cascade. If you are the system operator, you're going to be saying, oh my God, I've got storage, I've got demand side, I've got different assets coming in at different times of the, of, of the day. This has to be absolutely deeply digitalized and with all the protections that go with it. But it's going to need, require a much more dynamic and bi-directional scheme, interacting in dynamic markets. So when people think that digitalization of the energy system is some form of... So, so when we started the digitalization task force, it was quite funny because um, <clears throat> we got all the networks in the room and one of them said, oh, I've got a fabulous person, absolutely brilliant on digitalization. You must meet him. He rolled off, he rolled out uh, Microsoft Word really, really well within the organization. And I was going, oh, right, okay, fine. So I think we've got to really go back here and start working out what your understanding of digitalization and data and all the rest of it. It is not the IT department in that sense. It is much, much deeper. And to be frank, also, when we look at it, it's going to have to be structural digitalization. Not, it's not an add-on. It's not a, a nice little halo that, you know, one can get rewards for. It is actually part of the structure um, of the system. And these are the key components which give you whole system visibility, interoperability, and automation. Absolutely crucial is this customer control and consent. If you don't have that, you don't have flexibility assets. Actually, you get um, very, very clear rejection. Autom automated asset registration. So um, this is being developed at the moment in the UK. Um, so that is quite far down the line. Um, we also propose the digital spine, which is a very, very, very thin layer of interoperability across the whole system. And it, I would call it the HTML of energy. And I'm also working with the IEA to look at this as a global asset. So there's some really interesting stuff going on there. And we can talk about that at some point. Um, share, share data. It's always an interesting one. All these companies thinking, oh, my God, my data is incredibly valuable. It's so exciting. So what are you doing with it? Well, I don't know, but we've got it and it's really, really exciting. And I'm sure one day it will be really valuable. And they haven't even got data analysts to understand what really they're sitting on. The value of it is actually by sharing it. Um, and system operator visibility. So that is the digital journey that we've been proposing. And very, very last, but really the problem ultimately and it's not the problem with the energy sector it's the problem with so many different sectors and that is that we need to change our culture and our skills and everything is not about silos it's about connectivity and interaction um we've got to be looking at greater diversity in all senses but actually there's a there's a very good bad lesson um, apparently, VW was one of the very last companies to become, um, to really embrace the EV change and how they did it. And this friend of mine who used to work for VW said, um, well, it's not really surprising. Have you looked at the board? So the board, very diverse, fantastic in terms of superficially, they were all mechanical engineers. There you go. <laughs> They could not believe that anybody would want to get into a horrible EV car. The other thing that's quite funny is, I don't know if you know, but Henry Ford's wife, Mrs. Ford, in the 20s, um, she loved her EV car much, much more than she did her petrol car. And ultimately, um, she got over uh, ridden by, uh, by the market, not by Henry, because he was actually quite keen um, on EVs as well. So. I'm going to suggest I would love to see um, the system operator in whichever country, the first country that does this, I will send them a bunch of flowers. I would love a chief executive of DHL to be running a system operation. Right? If you think about this system, it is absolutely extraordinary. So I've got a pair of trainers in China. 
they go through about seven different transport vectors. Actually, human beings are in the middle of it. You don't have human beings in the system in that sense. You're not got people picking things up and putting them onto something. So let's say seven different transport vectors, all of them interrelated, all of them run by different people, right? So, you know, the shipper is not the same as the trucker. And I, the customer, can see where at any moment, right the way through the whole process, where, where that pa package is and if there's a problem or whatever. This is both customer centric, and I wouldn't have thought a logistics company could be seen as being customer centric, they have. And the logistics of dealing with all the variabilities, it is all done through real deep digitalization algorithms, et cetera. But they can preempt and they can predict and then they can reshape their routings. So it's a really, they're really, really sophisticated. It's not DHL, it's all of those guys, right? The telco sector, really, really important. Um, how that works, particularly with the digitalized sort of, you know, multi-faceted system, I think is really important. Consumer marketing. Oh, please, can, oh, sorry. Please can we get consumer marketing people in to the energy sector? exciting propositions and Amazon that again gives me a lot of visibility and control so losers and winners so if you're a milk farmer you're going to be a loser you've got to become a cheese maker um if what you're doing is just selling a commodity you're going to lose out to people who are actually uh, designing and selling optimization services if you take the victim approach to a customer you will lose them to more innovative companies. And I'd love to see more data turned into products and services. This is a little tour of, you could say, you know, crazy vision. But I think that all the dynamics in terms of what decarbonization means, what the new cost base is, what we've got to deliver consumers and how quickly we've got to do that. I think we can learn from others. We can really start to understand what this system could look like and i think we would also then give in many ways the customer and society a decarbonization dividend rather than in many ways giving them the bill thank you very much Well, I don't know about you, but I found that absolutely fascinating. And as you said, a tour, a, like right across such an expanse. I can just, I really marvel at your ability and skill to bring all of this to life in the room, to take on relatively complex um, elements of this um, whole agenda and explain it. And your use of analogy and your ability just to, you know, the, the fridge wouldn't, you know, if we didn't have fridges, we'd have to, the supermarket would be, all of those sort of that, there's so many of them in the course of your presentation that actually would bring home um, any of these complex uh, propositions to even a very general audience. Now, this is not, let's be honest, a general audience. This is a, an expert audience, but I'm sure it fascinated people in this room and indeed online, because I should have mentioned earlier, welcome to those of you who uh, have uh, joined us online and are still with us. I know there's upwards of 70 of you, so I know most of you will still be with us and we still have a nice group of people in the room. You all look very interested and I'm sure you all have questions and I'm open to questions and I'm sure Laura is as well, at least for a few minutes. So who would like to offer? John, John Fisher. Say who you are. We probably know who you are, but tell us anyway. John Fitzgerald, Trinity College, Dublin. Um, two questions. Security. Mm -hmm. um, a digitized system. My nightmare when I was on the board of the central bank was the payment system. Um, somebody, the Russians interfering with it, that you could collapse, uh, right, the payment system, you could collapse the economy for a few days, but collapsing the energy system is worse. So how can you deal with that risk? And the second, I found very striking at uh, two nuclear power stations that's the equivalent storage of all the evs in britain um to what extent can you use that you gave the example of spain distributed storage mm -hmm. but if you have a couple who are expecting a baby imminently and 
you you that battery is drained through the night to provide yep. storage um do you do people have to say actually i'm going to need the car in the next hour where normally they don't so how do you deal with that issue okay um Starting with the security thing, so we had a lot of pushback from the sector when we talked about um, open data for the energy system, right? I mean, when we're talking, if we're talking about Russians and we're talking about interference. And they sort of said, well, you know, then people are going to be able to manipulate it and, and all the rest of it. And I said, well, it's really quite interesting when you look at the infrastructure in the energy sector. If you go to the little substation around the corner from where I live, it's got a little padlock on, right? If you go to the really important one, you've got security guards, gun dogs, etc. It's quite easy to know where the vulnerabilities are in the energy sector. Now, it's not to say that digitalization doesn't create, in some ways, a, a different routine and a different system design. But if you think the banking sector hasn't been bad, I mean, it hasn't really has been pretty robust. Um, all sorts of other systems that are really important have got the systems in place. We got GCHQ involved. We got everybody, or what I call the secret squirrels. They all came out and um, visited us. And there are some very, very clear protocols. It's not to say that it isn't vulnerable, but to be frank, it's vulnerable today and it is being encroached on today. You might find that just because things, um, my, my feeling is just because things aren't open, uh, 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 are closed, doesn't actually um, make them any safer. So I think there is lots and lots of system design that needs to be put in place there. Absolutely. But I don't think it makes it less resilient. So security, insecurity of supply, I actually think it makes it more resilient. And I think it gives you greater visibility. And one of the things that I think is going to happen as we get much more distributed assets is we are going to have more failures, right? Mm. But they're going to be quite limited failures. They're going to be... So we're going to have to be a little bit more relaxed about not i mean i'm you know the, the uk and i don't know about the irish but the uk gold platedness of the system is is beyond any other country i mean it's absolutely it, it's sort of absurd and so we can act, we can lose a little bit but if i've got pv or an ev or a heat pump or something with flexibility in it i have got more resilience and so I think it's going to be, be useful that. On the EVs, everything is about consumer consent and everything would have to be done pretty slowly. So when I was talking about the Nissan leasing company, I was saying 4,000 cars, right, would be available out of the 10,000. As I also said, I think it's actually 8,000 that will be static. You will have to start to learn and understand um and you can always say on your charging and i i'm with a, a very successful irish company that um tomorrow um which is an ev charging company and you can put absolutely on your consent i always want 20 miles in my tank whatever right or i always want 60 miles or i don't want to participate everything has to be driven by customers and that's where, in some ways, the energy sector is going to find itself up against lots of different preferences, and it's not really used to that. So it's a, a new world. Over here. Laura, w wonderful lecture, really thought-provoking. And um, sorry, Peter O'Shea, ESB, if anyone can't see me. Um, really thought-provoking. I thought some of the analogies were wonderful. Um, as an electricity professional for more years than I remember now, you know, the, the, the structure of the industry is very much generation, which is becoming smaller, you know, smaller bite sizes, networks, which are becoming bigger, uh, but yep. smarter, um, and suppliers who are becoming more engaged in the service part of the industry, and, and, and then, of course, the customers. 
but we are locked into that sort of structure, right? That's the structure we've sort of inherited um, through liberalization and before yep. that through engineeringization, if you like. So that's the structure of the industry. And what I'm seeing from your from your talk is something I think sort of transcends all of that. And I just want to give, give any, any thoughts to whether that sort of industry can develop organically or whether it really needs a really big push from government if we're to go in that direction. So I think you're absolutely right. I probably don't remember. Right, the very, very first slide, I had a child screaming in the corner, okay? <clears throat> And um, this is me being rude about our regulator. And I say to them that they've infantilized the sector, actually. I mean, they haven't, but it's one of my analogies. Um, in the sense that they, certainly in the UK, they will tell a network what color socks to wear on a Tuesday and what tie on a Thursday, right? And everything is, is process regulated rather than outcome regulated. And so, and if you think about it, and I don't know if it's, it, it's the same here, but I'm sure it is, nothing really fundamental has changed since, what, for 40 years, mm. right? The supply, I mean, has the consumer changed in 40 years in everything else that it's doing? I mean, it's a totally different animal. It's got totally different needs. If you look at the system, the system needs something very, very different. And so, the regulation hasn't, and the problem is, is that politicians are very frightened to tinker with it. I personally think the place to start is with the retail side, because that is the way that you can unlock the rest of it. And it is actually, in my view, where it should start. We've got in the UK a price cap, and the government is never going to be able to come off this price cap, ever unless it changes the whole experience. So it can't say, right, we're just going to take the price cap away. Right, everyone's going to go tonto. If what they say is actually, we have re-engineered and reshaped how you will be getting energy. And this is exciting and this will be much more tailored around you. They've got to create a better landing place and then they will come off the price, then they can, migrate off the price cap so at this moment there is an opportunity but on the whole it's so heavily regulated that you know the, your bill has to look the same as everybody else to be frank a customer today in the retail market is really just choosing between different colored logos mm. that is it right i mean and a marginal change with customer service but as nobody wants to ring their energy company, because they shouldn't want to ring their energy company, it's that's a negative rather than a positive. But so we need to, to start with the politics mm. of energy. And, it, and for all the worst reasons, it is very political at the moment. Mm. Then you redesign into the system. The other thing, of course, which is always fantastic with any politician is to say, Oh, minister, well, that would be very brave because the lights might go out. And that is always, and it, it's absolutely, it's a cliche beyond cliche beyond, beyond cliche. And you know, it works every single time. <laughs> it worked on me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> go for it. I got to, sorry, yeah. I realize the time. Sorry for. Um, I've got two offerings here. I'm going to take the two together, if that's yeah, okay. Yeah, so one, one question each, if you don't mind. And is there anybody else just really burning with a question? I'm sure there are, but unfortunately, time is against us. So I think I'll just take those two and then we'll close, if that's okay. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. And thank you very much for the talk and coming out of the car and going mm. straight on the stage. Well done. Um, I'm Fergal McNamara. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Fergal McNamara. I'm the co-chair of the Energy Group here at the Institute. And um, right. yeah. Perfect. And I was really struck by the slide that you put up, which was the new way of looking at the levelized cost of energy, the whole of system cost. Oh, right, yes. yes and yes. that's definitely turned the table mats upside down because uh, some of the conventional wisdom that we would have assumed about the the costs of certain technologies is totally different as, a, as, a, as I just glanced at your slide. And you oh. said you wanted to do something with that. And that, that's what I wanted to explore with you. You said maybe in the capacity market, you could use it for evaluations or uh, treasury. You're, you're trying to impress treasury with it and, and get them to, to do something. Thank you. 
So it's I'll take of, my, let me take to your mind. Of course, okay? please, please. Sorry, you have to remember that one. Yes, no, it's fine. Donald Rollicon, I'm a member of the IIEA. My question is very simple. You've basically called for a major transformation of the um, electricity system. Uh, as a precondition of that, do you think that it is absolutely necessary to separate the uh, transmission and distribution uh, businesses from the generation businesses? As you know, here in Ireland, they're controlled, the ESB controls both and owns both. And uh, uh, I just ask you, is it a precondition for innovation that this separation uh, should take place? And I just don't mean a separation nominally, separation of financing, separation of management, separation of ownership. And I don't mean privatization. I'm against privatization of the networks and the wires. So I'll start with that, and, and I think everyone will have, a, in, in some ways, a different view. The way we've cut the sector up um, is pretty arbitrary. Um, I mean, it's, I don't know to what extent, I mean, I'm on the board of SSE Transmission, which is very separate from SSE's um, distribution network, right? And these are I, I don't really know what the logic was. And I think the logic was because how the energy system, when it was all nationalized, was structured, right? So I think it's a totally arbitrary thing. I think you could make a case for either way for it to be much more integrated, for one to look at new solutions. I mean, I would like to see um, a lot more microgrids and a lot more innovation in that field. But to be frank, on one level, I would say to you, we are at such a difficult moment where certainly in the UK, and I think it's exactly the same in Ireland, we have not got enough infrastructure <clears throat> to actually bring all this fantastic resource that we both benefit from. And I would just get on with it and not worry about those structures particularly. I would really look at planning. I would really... Um, this is very unlike me because I'm sort of quite, I like efficiency and productivity. I would do a bit of over build to just keep the cost, I mean, reduce the cost over the longer period of time, get it done. And then we've got, I mean, we, what we're doing in the UK, we're building farms in the middle of the North Sea and forgetting to build the roads to the farms, right? Fabulous. I mean, who thought of that? And it's just ludicrous. So I'm less interested in the structures of the distribution. What I would say is the, the distribution networks are very varied in the UK. We've got lots of different organizations and some of them are really, really good and really exciting. And others are just still hose pipes, not thinking about the future. And there does need to be a lot more tension there. On your whole, oh, I love that you like these, those metrics. Right, so what's very weird about, and I'm sure it's, it is the same in every government, you can tell me whether it is or not. Actually, the, this whole system design has been used for the last eight years in, in the UK for policy planning, not with the demand bit, but just on the supply bit, right? It's been used for policy planning, but it never really gets into policy. It's, it's really, really interesting. And it doesn't go beyond the modelers in the department, right? And the treasury don't even, I mean, so I've been doing quite a lot of workshops with them on whole system costs and for them to start to understand to use them as metrics. And really it's been the last two, 18 months, I would say, they're starting to understand it and they're starting to to appreciate it but god the levelized cost of electricity is so simple that's why we love it a silver bullet it's easy no variables etc cetera, etc cetera. oh and this woman comes along and she wants everything to be a bit more complicated um get her off um but we are getting quite a lot of traction um in parts of the treasury we are i'm doing as i say quite a lot of work with the iea and the World Economic Forum, um, we're doing a big piece of work for this COP coming up, which will be really trying to bottom this out. 
And the other thing that's interesting about it is once you've got those metrics, I've been talking to some of the pension funds and saying, are you interested in doing mini CFDs for heat pumps, for example, mm. right? They said, yeah, sure. Well, we did smart meters. We can do, as long as we've got some form of contractual um, underpinning, we can really lean into distributed <laughs> assets. So these metrics help value those assets within a whole system thing. Anyway, I dream, I dream a lot, okay. Um, so I hope, but um, they'll start to realize that certainly network costs and balancing costs are, are too big just to put as an extra in their calculations. Thank you so much. I'm just conscious of the time. Yeah, um, I'm sure people have things to do, um, but it's a real testament to the quality of our speaker and the interest that people have shown that there's so many people still here at 2.30 uh, and I know still online. I just want to thank um, sincerely, uh, Laura, as particularly as, as Fergal said, for just stepping down the steps and onto the stage without sort of missing a beat. So, um, but it just shows the, the professional from the political ar arena, advocacy, all the things that you've done, um, which I would normally go through and introduce a speaker at great length, but we just decided not to do that and have you straight on. But I think you've demonstrated without any introduction how, um, how, good at communicating you are these issues as I said I mean I'm we're crying out I think the world is crying out for people who can actually communicate these complex questions to the broad audience and I will say that you know in fairness to the ESB it that has been part of the ESB's business is not simply just to function as uh, an energy you know in the energy sector by the way if there's such a thing as an energy sector in a discrete sense anymore. And I think you've kind of made yes. that point that you can't read all of the old lines and demarcations are all kind of breaking down. But I think that, that's the business, you know, ESB has obviously got its own business to attend to, but wants to ensure that it's not just part of the debate, but fostering and facilitating these um, opportunities to um, disseminate information and help people analyze how things are changing so fast. It's also the business that we're in, um, in the Institute, the IIEA, um, so it's been my great pleasure to chair this session. We've three, four more to go in this um, uh, in this series. Um, I want to thank you all for your attendance here today, both uh, in person and uh, those of you who have joined online. Um, thanks to Bevan Cody um, in particular and her team in the ESP. Uh, thanks to my own team in the IIEA. And we look forward to seeing you all again. But most importantly, a big round of applause for our terrific speaker, Laura Sam. Thank you.